put any background noise. There you can hear that it's recording. Um, and we will be using the video function. So especially at the end, once Claire has stopped presenting, um, it would be really nice if you can all turn your videos on if you feel comfortable doing so, just so we can sort of see who we're speaking to. Um, when it comes to questions, you can either put them in the chat box or raise your hand. Either is fine and um, yeah. Okay, so just to give you a quick overview of who we are, some of you may know us and we may have already had a few conversations with you and some of you may have never heard of us. So RGI is a Europe-wide organization based in Berlin in Germany. And I would say we're quite a unique organization because we're a collaboration of NGOs and transmission system operators from across Europe that are engaging in an energy transition ecosystem of actors. And our aim is to basically promote the fair, transparent, sustainable, just grid development to enable the growth of renewables and to achieve the type of energy transformation that we're all aiming for. And just to give you a brief context to the webinar series. So while RGI mainly works within and throughout Europe, we have recently started sort of expanding our scope because we see a lot of need in sharing the knowledge that um, we have gathered among our members, among our network, um, and among their networks in Europe with other regions of the world, but most specifically with other civil society organizations who are key players in the energy transformation as well and who have a big role to play. And so here you can see some of the main topics that we have sort of decided through conversations are the some of the key issues. They're very broad and um, there will be webinars several for each of these and um, hopefully we will be able to dive more deeply into these um, following the sort of introductory webinars. And because these are sort of the, the first in a series, we, especially today, hope to send you a survey afterwards so that we can get an idea of what you may have been missing, some of the questions also within the topic of public engagement that you um, want to have answered, maybe also very context specific topics, and that we can sort of mold what we have around these questions. And so without further ado, I would like to introduce you to our speaker, Dr. Claire Haggett. She is a senior lecturer at the University of Edinburgh and has spent over 20 years researching the topic of public responses to renewable energy developments. Um, she has conducted research projects for the Scottish government, largely on offshore renewables, um, and has uh, conducted lots of research funded by many other institutions and organizations. And Claire today will be drawing on a range of examples and giving you a series of recommendations of how to develop renewable energy alongside rather than against um, local communities and people because people are key for the energy transition. And I will end my introduction here and pass the floor to Claire. And you can start sharing your screen. That's great. Thanks very much indeed, Sophie. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to speak to you all today. Um, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm afraid Edinburgh isn't quite as blue and sunny as it looks in the picture behind me, but it's a very warm welcome from Edinburgh. Uh, my name is Claire Haggett and I'm delighted to be talking about research on understanding public responses to renewable energy so that we can think about how to move forward to a clean energy future. And my plan for today is to draw on academic research from around the world. So there has been about two decades of research trying to understand public responses to renewable energy. So I'm gonna give quite a quick synthesis of some of that research over the next 45 minutes or so. And the examples that I'm going to be talking about apply across different technologies. So there's been research around the world looking at a range of different technologies, different developers, different developments, different countries, different contexts, different continents. 
And what I'm going to be doing is pulling out some of the principles that apply across all of those different things. So my plan for this session is to talk about three things, a session in three parts this morning or this afternoon, depending on where you are. In the first part, I'm going to be talking about some of the myths that perhaps still exist about public responses to renewable energy. In the second part, I'll talk about some of these repeated reasons, repeated principles that emerge from across research about why people support or oppose renewable energy developments. And then in the third part, we'll think a bit more positively about how we might move forward, how we can build on the lessons that we've learned and how we can apply those to be thinking about clean energy futures. So first part, thinking about some myths. And I think perhaps the first myth, and Sophie's already mentioned this, is a myth that people don't really matter when we're thinking about renewable energy. And I, that's sort of understandable because renewable energy faces a whole host of challenges. Uh, renewable energy faces legal, financial, regulatory challenges. It's, it's something which is fraught with a number of difficulties. And in addition, climate change is here, it's now, it's happening, it's real. So it might be easy to think that people aren't really that important when there are all these challenges and the urgency of moving forward with renewable energy. But I'm going to suggest that people matter for two reasons. The first reason that people matter when we're thinking about clean energy is because it's the right thing to do to involve people in decisions that affect them. It's the right thing, it's the fair thing, it's the moral, the ethical thing to do. And this coincides with two pieces of work. Firstly, on moving towards what's called a just transition towards clean energy futures, towards low carbon. And it concords with a wealth of academic research on something called energy justice. And I'm gonna talk a little bit more about both of those things. So energy justice is a concept that academics, particularly Benjamin Sovacol, he's a preeminent scholar here, talk about. And energy justice being a concern for any society that wants to think of itself as being fair. And probably most of us think that's a, a fairly good thing to do. Energy justice has three aspects to it. The first aspect is what's called distributional justice. And that means trying to balance costs and benefits of moving towards clean energy futures. The second part is recognitional justice. And what we're trying to do there is to recognize and identify people or groups who may be affected by a move towards clean energy and trying to understand how and why they value the particular places in which they live. And then the third part of energy justice is about procedure. It's about fairness. It's about the process of making decisions. So trying to make sure that those affected are involved with meaningful participation and that they are given a voice. So involving people in decisions about renewable energy fits with all of these aspects of what's called energy justice. It also fits with what's known as a just transition, a fair transition, a fair and equitable way of envisaging a clean future. And my example here is from the Scottish government here in Scotland. So the Scottish government are talking about a just transition moving towards net zero, low carbon, but making sure that that is done in a way which is fair, that the benefits and costs are equally distributed and that there's a fair process. So as Sophie said at the start, what we're absolutely thinking about here with a just transition is working with communities, working alongside communities, making sure that re renewable energy isn't something which is done to communities, but working with them. And this isn't just something which is here in Scotland. So this is European wide. Um, the European Commission has 
for example, um, Just Transition Platform, Just Transition Mechanism, forums and funding to be able to move towards net zero and sustainable futures, but doing so in a fair and equitable way. And it's not just the European Commission. So I'm doing some research currently with the United Nations on a move towards clean renewable energy futures. And the roadmap that the UN have written talks about the need for socially inclusive development, equitable development, addressing social concerns, maximizing social benefits. So all of this is about working alongside, working with communities. So the first reason that it's important perhaps to work with people is a, a moral an ethical reason because it's the right thing to do. So if the first reason is that it's the right thing to do to work with people, the second thing, second reason is a much more pragmatic one and that it's important to understand people's concerns. It's important to acknowledge that people matter because of the effectiveness of opposition. So across Europe, across the US, across Australia, places around the world where a renewable energy project is proposed, there is very often very well organized, very vociferous, very effective opposition to that project. And this has led in places around the world to long delays for projects and the abandonment of projects. So people are opposing renewable energy and they're doing it very effectively. And it might be tempting to think, well, if there is this opposition, then what we need to do is we just need to force things through. But research has found that just trying to impose things on people against their will actually makes things worse. It creates or hardens opposition. It um, creates cynicism. It creates a lot of antagonism. And that bad news about how a project is being developed spreads very easily. So campaign groups are in contact with each other, spreading the bad news about bad developments or developments done badly. The flip side of that, the, the better news is that projects done well have the opportunity to spread good news about them. And we've done research which has found exactly that. If a project is developed alongside a community, then the good news about the benefits that the projects can bring, that also spreads. And of course, involving people in decisions means an opportunity to harness their really rich and valuable knowledge about their local places, about their local landscapes, about their local communities. And people who live in these places know them best. So the myth that people don't matter, well, I think it is just a myth. And people matter because it's the right thing to do to involve them. And it's also the practical, pragmatic thing to do. Okay, second myth is that people just get used to living near renewable energy projects. So they might not have been too keen during planning. Um, they might not have been very happy during construction, but once a project is operational, so the myth says, people just get used to it. And that perhaps was the case at the start of your renewable energy projects being developed, but perhaps not so much anymore. And I think that's partly because of the cumulative impact of clusters of projects all in the same locations. So lots of projects located where there is a particularly rich natural resource. And we did some research in Cumbria in the northwest of England, and there are a lot of wind farms in that area. Um, there's also a lot of sheep, as you can probably tell from the quote, and people not getting used to living near wind farms or not supporting them the more that they saw. And there are a number of places where there are these concentrations of um, renewable energy projects. So this is a map of the UK and you can probably see that little yellow dot there. That's me here in Edinburgh. Good morning, everyone. Um, there's a little red dot marked a bit lower down um, southwest of Edinburgh. If we zoom in a bit more, so it's a little area there. It's only a, um, a few kilometers wide. It's a very small area just southwest of where I am now. And if we zoom in a bit more, so that's that same area, and the arrow is pointing at a little town called Moniive, and none of you will ever have heard of it because it's very tiny. But even though it's very tiny, it's surrounded by wind farms, 
So this is quite a concentration of either existing or proposed wind farms just in a very small area. And what we find in research is that being near such a concentration doesn't necessarily encourage people's support for those projects, particularly if some of that direct experience that people are having is a negative experience. And research finds that if people see, for example, wind turbines not working, then that doesn't encourage them to support those projects or any future proposals. So the myth here that people get used to living near projects, it might be the case, but we can't assume that that's what will happen. Okay, third myth is that people who protest against renewables are all just NIMBYs. And I'm sure some of you have heard of this acronym NIMBY. So it stands for not in my backyard. And it's a classic explanation that's been used for a long time now, not just about renewable energy projects, but about local development. Um, so it could be a wind farm or it could be a, a housing development or a hospital or a prison or a waste incinerator. There's lots of different projects about which the protesters are called NIMBYs. And within that term, there are a few assumptions. Um, it's assumed that people who are protesting are in agreement that we need this particular thing. So everyone knows that we need the wind farm, the hospital, the waste incinerator, whatever it is. There's assumptions that we want this thing, but the people who are protesting just don't want it near them. They don't want it in their backyard. They are selfishly saying that can go somewhere else. And this label is quite a powerful one, calling somebody a NIMBY, because as soon as you call somebody a NIMBY, that's a very neat way of being able to dismiss their concerns. So they're just a NIMBY, they're just being selfish, we don't have to listen to them. However, research from around the world, across Europe, but wider as well, has found that actually NIMBY, specifically NIMBY as a term, doesn't really help to explain opposition to wind farms. We don't really find many NIMBYs. We find opponents, certainly plenty of opponents, but whether they can all safely be categorized as NIMBYs, well, research doesn't think so. So research from the Netherlands in particular has looked at the way that people don't necessarily weigh up purely selfishly their own sorts of calculations about whether something will benefit or hinder them. They think much more broadly, they are much more um, altruistic than the NIMBY label tends to apply. So people might be worried about jobs, not their own job, but jobs for other people in the community. So they're not all quite as selfish as a NIMBY might seem to um, assume. And people aren't necessarily all misinformed or uneducated or stupid or parochial, as again the term implies. Sometimes people are very well informed or sometimes they do have um, concerns which are based in their knowledge and their understanding and their experience of being in a particular place. And the NIMBY label just doesn't take account of that. And it doesn't take account of people who aren't local, but who are still protesting. Um, so these people are called Niabies, bear with me. So Niabi is um, um, building something not in anybody's backyard, not just in your own backyard. And as I'm sure you are all sensing, this is a terrain which is fraught with acronyms. So we have our NIMBYs, we have our Niabies. Uh, we also have Lulus, so that's locally unwanted land uses. And my personal favorite, Bananas, so banana build absolutely nothing, absolutely near, um, oh, sorry, away, from, I'm going to have to write that down. Banana basically means don't build anything near anybody. And if it's an insult to call somebody a banana, which it is, it's also an insult to call them a NIMBY because it's always an insult. It's always a pejorative term. It's never a term that's used to try and helpfully understand what might be going on. And calling somebody a NIMBY, that will get their back up. It's not a way to build a productive relationship. It's not a way to try and build trust or understanding. 
But unfortunately, the term NIMBY is very broadly used and means that we don't get a sense of actually what's going on. It means that the actual causes of opposition are obscured and are hidden. So what we want to do, the best way to try and move forward is not to call protesters NIMBYs, but to understand the reasons why they might be opposing a project. Okay, quick summary so far. So I've been dispelling some myths. I've been suggesting that people do matter. They don't always get used to things, but they're not necessarily NIMBYs. What we need to do, therefore, is to look at research on some of the clear, identifiable and repeated reasons for support and opposition, the things that the NIMBY label obscures. So second part, that's what we're going to do. We're going to draw on this research, which finds these repeated principles from across technologies, across developers, across countries, across contexts, these repeated reasons that people protest against renewable energy. And taking account of this great body of academic research, I've sort of grouped these reasons into these four different categories, and I'll go through each one of those in turn. Okay, so the first sort of set of reasons, the first category, why people protest against renewable energy projects, research finds, is due to what are perceived to be threats to the, the nature of an area, the character, the identity, the integrity of an area, what it means to live there, the way of life in that place. And this is sometimes because places are seen as just too special to host a renewable energy project, just too beautiful, just too rare, just too important to host these technologies. One of the examples I have here is in the south of Scotland, and this is an area which has a number of designations for its beauty, for the resources that are there. Um, it's a designated an area of special scientific interest. So this is an area, protesters were saying, was valuable on a national and even an international scale. So we're not just talking about local value, but national and international value. So there are a set of reasons around places just being too special or too important. The second set of reasons why people oppose renewable energy are to do with issues in that particular place in which a project is planned. And contexts will vary. In any location, there will be economic, historical, political, social, cultural issues that influence what happens there and how projects are received. The issues will differ, but the fact that there will be some issues is the same everywhere. There will be things in those particular locations that influence how people feel about that place and how they respond to any project that might be proposed there. The example that I have here is, it's an offshore example because I think it's a particularly interesting example. It was an example when I was doing this research that surprised me. Um, so this is from the east coast of England and an opposition group set up there for people living near hazardous industry. And this is an area which hosts the majority of the UK's petrochemical industry and has done for, for generations. So this is an area also which has tallow burning. There was um, a series of projects to clear asbestos out of ships from around the world. This is an area which is not beautiful on a national or an international scale. It's not precious or rare. It doesn't have designations for landscape beauty. This is an area which is heavily scarred by the petrochemical industries. Um, if you're looking at the picture of that beach there and thinking that beach looks a bit grey, is it something to do with the photograph? No, the beach is a bit grey. This is not a beautiful area at all. Interestingly, opposition group for people living near hazardous industry. So you might be thinking, I wonder if this is people opposing new petrochemical factories. No, this was people opposing an offshore wind farm. And that feels quite strange. I was surprised in an area that was so despoilt by industry that people wouldn't welcome a clean green energy project. 
but this was a real lesson for me and it's um, something that we should find in research about the importance of local environments for the people who live there and people that we spoke to in this area talked about the view offshore being the last unspoiled view that they had, being a sign of pure untouched nature with all the, the, the pollution around them, with the scars of industry around them, looking out to sea was something special for them. So this was, this was interesting and it's an example of the way in which local environments matter to the people who live there and that experience and perception of what counts as valuable can vary and can be difficult for us as outsiders looking into a particular place to understand why it's important or why it matters. I have another slightly nicer example of this with some research that we did in a much more rural area, much more beautiful area um, in the south of Scotland. And this is another example of the way that places matter to the people who live in them. And that landscapes are full of memory, they're full of meaning, they're not just something to look at from outside, but they are lived in and they are embodied with this meaning and value. So this is a very flat map of that area. So that was a, a picture of the area with some of the sheep grazing. This is what the map looks like. And it's just a map of different land uses in this particular area in South Scotland. And this map, it shows us land use, but it doesn't really show us very much more than that. What we asked local people to do was to try and show us what that place meant. And suddenly this is a much richer understanding of that landscape, what it means, the sorts of activities that go on there now, that have gone in there on in the past, that will be happening in the future. And suddenly this is a, a snapshot that gives us much more of a sense of meaning and attachment and value. Okay, so third sort of broad set of reasons that research has found leading people to oppose renewable energy are to do with a disjuncture between the great national international benefits that come from renewable energy projects and local immediate tangible frequently experienced disbenefits and people tend to engage understandably with things that they experience here and now so we know that climate change is happening, but for many of us, climate change is spatially and temporarily removed. This is something which will happen in the future. Something happening now, today, has much more resonance, much more significance. And the proportional reduction in CO2 emissions from someone who lives near a, a solar plant might be a very small and intangible benefit compared to something that they might be experiencing, um, noise or traffic or disruption and so on. And research has found that this is a very powerful perception, this disjuncture, this lack of fit between the great benefits that come from renewable energy and the impacts that might be experienced. So this is an example from the south coast of England where a very large project was planned. It was going to be hundreds of turbines generating a huge amount of clean energy. What was interesting was that the coverage of this proposal, all the press coverage of it, was about what would be lost. It was about the threats to um, the um, threats to nature reserves nearby, the threats to bird life, the threats to wildlife, the threats to sea life, the threats to world-class sailing. This, this area had hosted the sailing from the London 2012 Olympics. Threats to sailing, threats to fishing, threats to tourism upon this, which this area absolutely depended, and therefore consequently threats to a whole way of life, threats to the local economy, threats to the people who lived there. All of this narrative was all about threats 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 what would be lost these dreadful risks that we be in, would, would, sorry that would be endured if this project went ahead and there was nothing about what could be gained it was all about this narrative all about what could be lost and after many years this project was delayed and delayed and delayed and it eventually went to an inquiry and it was rejected and it was very interesting that one of the reasons behind the lack of support and the very fierce opposition was about this lack of fit between benefits and impacts. The fourth set of reasons why people protest against renewable energy are to do with the process, the process through which a project is delivered. 
And this really matters. And this is part of a just transition, part of procedural justice. And very often we find that people don't necessarily react badly to change. They don't necessarily react badly to a renewable energy project. What they object to is the way in which the process is moving forward, the way in which decisions are being made, the way in which um, a developer doesn't necessarily show any concern for the local environment, the way in which they feel they have no voice. These things really matter. And Stefan Danborg, writing in Denmark, talks about the way in which a lack of communication is a perfect catalyst for creating opposition, actually a process creating opponents, not the project creating opponents, but the process, which is really fascinating. And so there are things to say about the nature of any consultation or any engagement that does happen. Richard Hindmarsh, writing in Australia, talks about double speak. And what he means by that is sometimes there is real involvement for local people. Sometimes it's just going through the motions. Sometimes it's just a tick box. Sometimes it's seeming as if there is engagement, but actually in reality, people aren't being listened to. And what I find really compelling is Catherine Gross's work. She is again writing about Australia and she suggests that a fair process is absolutely vital because if people believe that the process has been fair, if they believe it's been open and transparent, they've had an opportunity to express themselves and they've been listened to and respected. If people believe that the process has been fair, then they are much more likely to support or at the very least not oppose the outcome that comes from that process. So process, absolutely vital. I have a, a good example of bad process. Um, so this was some work we did with the fishing communities um, who are key stakeholders, absolutely fundamental to, um, to communicate with fishers about the development of offshore energy projects. And developers that we spoke to said that they had bent over backwards in trying to engage with fishers. They'd gone to lots of effort. They'd set up big public meetings, but no one had turned up. When we spoke to the fishers, we found out that these public meetings had been at times when they were all out at sea. And actually fishers don't necessarily tend to respond very well to big open meetings. It's a, a person to person oral based sort of culture very often. So whilst the developer had gone to lots of effort, it wasn't appropriate, it wasn't meaningful. It wasn't actually an opportunity to really negotiate with and collaborate with fishing communities. Okay, third part. Where do we go from here? How do we move forward? There's been a wealth of academic research. How do we take this forward? How do we move towards clean energy futures? How do we get renewable energy up and running? If people aren't necessarily uneducated, selfish, I mean, some people are fairly annoying, but most people, let's say, aren't selfish, uneducated NIMBYs and Let's say, because research has found that most people do support renewable energy, but sometimes turn against it. What can we do? What can we learn from two decades of academic research? Well, I think there's three things that we can learn. We know that social context matters. We know that there are things in the places in which projects are planned that matter. So therefore, we need to find out what those are. So if a project is planned in a particular place, we need to identify identify the communities and the people and the issues that matter in that particular place. We need to demonstrate a knowledge and an understanding and a care of those places. And there's great potential to capitalize on some of that knowledge. Um, so for example, there are communities around the UK that used to be coal mining villages, coal mining communities. And there is some really good work going on trying to turn those into clean energy commu communities rather than dirty energy communities. So it might be a very positive way of capturing the history of a place and moving forward. And you may be thinking that this work to identify people and communities and issues that matter in certain places sounds like a lot of time and money and effort and hard work. And if you were thinking that, you would be right. But what research finds is absolutely that this is time and money and effort well spent. So getting to know a community, identifying the issues there, it matters and it makes a difference. 
The second thing that we can learn from this wealth of academic research is about a fair and open process. So finding out about these issues, about what matters by using open and ongoing engagement, using methods that are appropriate, trying to collaborate, trying to build good relationships with local people. And there's been academic research which has looked specifically at participation and the rationales under which participation is undertaken. So, for example, there are different auspices, different rationales to try and engage with local communities. If we're thinking about awareness raising, so just one side of the table, if we're thinking about awareness raising, that's a one way distribution of information. So developer telling people about a project, about the project specification, about the location in which it needs to be, why it needs to be there, why not somewhere else, what the project will look like. So there is a certain amount of information that is useful to have, but this is just a, a one way giving of information. The aim of this is usually to try and get people on board and the promise is only that we will keep you informed. If we're thinking about consulting with local people, then that's a bit different because this is then, so moving across the table, this is then thinking about trying to consult with local people and to hear their views. So this is two-way communication, obtaining feedback, listening to what people say. And the aim here is to gain an insight into what people think, not just to give them information. So the promise to people is we will keep you informed, but we will also listen. But good engagement, academic research says, comes on the other side of the table where we're working with people throughout. So it's ongoing and it's trying to value local people, not just to hear their opinions, but to value their presence throughout the decision making processes, which is good for a particular project, ideally means a better project, more appropriately cited, but also has benefits in terms of enhancing community capacity, building social capital, enhancing democracy, that people have an influence on the decisions that will affect them. So academic research has found that there are different rationales under which um, engagement is taken. And we did a project looking at some of the methods that are used underneath these different rationales. So um, if you are awareness raising, then you might um, set up a website about the project that you're trying to develop and what it's about and why it's here and what it will mean. And of course, there is a place for giving information, absolutely. But what research suggests is that that isn't where engagement should stop. It shouldn't just be about awareness raising and that ideally, perhaps, we are looking for methods that sit in the middle of this Venn diagram. We're looking for something like a workshop where information can be given, um, responses can be obtained, and we can discuss with participants what this might mean, or having a community spokesperson, a representative to work between communities and developers. And I have some better examples of engagement done well. So better work with local fishers, which did take forward some of these sorts of principles. So ongoing engagement, setting up um, a liaison, someone who was trusted by both the developer and the fishing communities to work between, to negotiate between them, to share concerns, to share views, to share expertise. And the picture at the bottom is of some onshore infrastructure in Cornwall in the very southwest tip of England. And again, the same sorts of principles for this, um, this infrastructure that's there that used um, a community liaison, a spokesperson based in that local community area. So, so there was a presence there and that implied that the developer cared about, knew about, wanted to know more about what was happening locally as part of a process of ongoing engagement. And academic research points to a number of principles for this good engagement, not uh, Richard Hindmarsh's double speak, but good engagement. And making sure, for example, that the principles are established and that um, the decisions haven't already been made beforehand. That, and it's clear to communities what is up for discussion and perhaps what has already been decided or can't be changed. 
it's important to make sure that the timing of engagement ideally starts early and is ongoing, isn't just sort of tacked on at the end. And it's important to make sure that ideally the approach is about encouraging a co-production of knowledge rather than just, just being awareness raising and telling people things. It's important that access to engagement is widely available. So it's not just always the same people or the powerful people locally who have the biggest, loudest voices, that we are proactively identifying marginalized groups and making sure that we provide them the opportunities to engage and providing those opportunities through methods that are appropriate. Um, so for example, sometimes it's quite hard for local people to articulate what a place might mean to them. But there are some really fascinating visual methods, including the mapping exercise I showed you earlier, where it becomes much easier for people to try and express why somewhere matters or what they've done there or what it means to them using visual methods, using maps, using photographs. There are lots of ways that we can try and encourage people to be able to participate through appropriate methods. And finally, it's important to make sure that the results of any engagement are fed back to people so that their responses don't just disappear into a black box and, and are never seen of or heard of again, that actually we are communicating back to communities what was done with their responses, why any changes were made, and if not, what how the project will be moving forward. And I have a couple of examples of this. So this is a fairly large um, onshore substation in the east of England. And the developer for this project talked about the aim of community engagement being to provide an opportunity for relevant local communities to put forward their views and have a role in developing proposals. So that's, that's really interesting. And that's actually what happened. So there were changes made to the location of the substation on the basis of what local people said. So not just involving people, not just listening to them, but taking action. And this is um, another example. So this is the Havsnas wind farm. Apologies to any Swedish speakers for my Swedish accent. This is the Havsnas wind farm. It's the largest one in Sweden. And this embodied some of the good principles of good engagement about which we've been talking. So appointing somebody to um, represent the community and to work between the community and the developer, listening to community concerns about environmental um, issues nearby and making changes on the basis of what local people said. And of course, it may not always be possible to make changes, but what matters is listening to people, communicating to them why those changes might not have been possible, but making sure that there is open channels of communication through which people feel respected and involved. OK, so I said that there were going to be three lessons that we can learn from academic research. The first was to identify the community, the places, the people that matter. The second was the engagement processes through which we learn about all of that. The third thing, and this is the final thing about which I'll speak, the third thing we need to do is think about delivering benefits to local communities. And this is because of that very powerful perception of a disjuncture between national and international benefit and local disadvantage. And again, this is part of a just transition, moving fairly towards clean energy futures. And this is the Scottish government's just energy transition. And you can see that they have a range of steps, a range of outcomes in which they are um, hoping to progress. And it's to do with them, lots of things, jobs and skills, adapting to climate change, a whole range of things. What I'm interested in particular is the emphasis on citizens, communities and place and on the fair distribution of costs and benefits and sharing the benefits of climate action widely. And I, I think that's a fascinating emphasis, sharing the benefits of climate action widely. So not just having a renewable energy project because it's good in and of itself, because it's good because it's generating clean energy, but sharing the benefits that come from climate action. And I think it's important to say that sometimes there's an assumption that we might be able to buy the support of local communities, that if we give them 
benefits in some way if we set up a community fund that we can buy their support and research is very clear that that is not the case people cannot be bought because this assumes that they put a price on landscape value they put a price on the specialness of areas around them research very strongly finds that benefits are appropriate but that they are only appropriate when they are part of a fair and open process, when they are far part of a bigger and ongoing commitment by developers to local communities, that the fair process is the thing that matters and that benefits will come as part of that and that discussions about benefits, about what sort of benefits might be most meaningful, might be most needed, might be most appropriate locally, those discussions about benefits take place as part of that fair and ongoing process. And this article was published two days ago, so this is hot off the press news. So this is um, a principle that applies very broadly across a range of different technologies. Um, article here talking about landowners who only a very small minority of them wanted compensation. Most did not want compensation for grid development, not interested in monetary gain. Most landowners were interested in equal distribution. They were interested in fairness. Fairness is what matters, not trying to buy people's support. And in fact, talking about benefits, if it comes after opposition has already emerged, if it comes late in the process, it sometimes is perceived to be a bribe and can actually make things worse. So the fair and open and transparent process is the thing that matters. And I have just a quick example of benefits being delivered. So this is the European Offshore Wind Deployment Centre. This is off the coast of Aberdeen. So Aberdeen is um, a city on the east coast of Scotland. Um, it's a place that um, traditionally was the heart of the oil and gas industry in Scotland. Um, there's um, a new wind farm here. This wind farm became I was going to say famous, perhaps infamous, because former President Trump didn't like it because he would be able to have seen it from his new golf course. So this was a wind farm around which there was a lot of notoriety. The 11 yellow dots that you can see just offshore, those are the turbines. And you can see the cabling route that comes onshore to the substation. And the substation is located at a little little village, very small village called Black Dog, just on the coast. And this is what Black Dog looks like. So you can probably just see in the picture across the top of the picture, um, the houses there, that's the village of Black Dog. And then this site in the front, quite a, a large site, which was cleared to provide the substation. So much bigger than the village itself, this is a wide area which has been transformed in order to host the substation. And this is the development work undergoing again, you can just see the houses of Black Dog just in the, the top of the picture and all the work that was going on. And you can see, of course, that the, there's one road in and out of Black Dog, which is the one road that was bringing all of this um, industry into this particular location. And then this is the substation. So again, you can see the, the village at the top and then the scale of this project on their doorsteps. What's very interesting is that there is a community fund set up to support local communities along the coastline, but with money ring fenced for the community in Black Dog. And this community fund um, funds applications from local community groups to support clean energy futures. So for example, it has funded solar panels on the, the roof of the village hall, and it has um, supported payments towards an electric vehicle for a local disabled group. So this isn't about buying support. This is about acknowledging the hosting that takes place, acknowledging that there may be negative impacts and trying to give something back to those communities, trying to work in partnership to find out what local need is in those communities and giving something back to them. And there are a range of different sorts of benefits. So in Scotland, there are government guidelines and government principles on the sorts of benefits. And again, the sorts of benefits that are needed will vary because different contexts are different, but a range of different sorts of benefits are possible. And sometimes they're very significant. It's very significant. They can really make a difference in local communities. So this is about a positive impact. This is about spreading the benefits widely that come from climate action. 
And this is part of ongoing consultation, part of open and fair process, and a very positive way of framing the development of renewable energy, thinking about partnerships with local communities, thinking about trying to involve people in developing something new, finding activities or facilities or projects locally that need support, trying to do something really positive, trying to encourage people, trying to build energy communities where we have proud hosts for some of this extraordinary technology. Final slide, just going to wrap up. So I've been trying to say that communities matter, people matter. They matter because it's the right thing to do to involve them. They matter pragmatically because of the effectiveness of opposition. And we can learn from research that responses to renewable energy are motivated by a number of factors which emerge repeatedly across different technologies and across different contexts. But that doesn't mean we're stuck. Actually, we can learn quite a lot from this about how to move forward. We can learn to try and balance the costs and benefits of particular projects. And we can learn to try and have a process that is fair, that is open and that is transparent and that involves people in ways that are meaningful to them. Um, because I'm an academic, I have, of course, added references to the end of this presentation, um, and I think Sophie is very helpfully going to make the slides available. So these are references, um, some of the ones that I've mentioned and some of the ones that are just quite useful um, on some of these topics. So just transition, energy justice, some references about participation, about public responses to renewables. Um, and um, I'm delighted to take questions, but I've put my email address here as well, because I'd be delighted to follow up afterwards with anyone who might might be interested. Um, but I think that's quite enough talking from me for the moment. So um, I'll hand back to Sophie for now, and I'd be delighted to take any questions. Thank you all very much indeed for listening. Thank you so much, Claire. This was a wonderful presentation. I think I can definitely say that I also learned a lot. Um, I would suggest that we open up the discussion now. Um, and it would be great if everyone turns on their video. If you don't feel comfortable, that's also fine, but um, just so that we can sort of see each other while we talk. Um, and feel free to either write your questions into the chat box or um, just raise your hand. Um, and I see that Hussein, Indus wrote something. It wasn't a question, but I don't know if you might want to expand on that. Um. Uh, yes, uh, that's actually comments comment on the presentation that uh, <clears throat> the issue highlighted in the presentation that most of the renewable energy developers, they do not uh, connect with communities uh, at the initial stage of the project. That is one of the key reason that communities then start opposing uh, oppo opposition of those kind of projects. We have uh, some lessons from Pakistan that uh, uh, there are multiple examples, not only uh, of the renewable energy projects, but some of the uh, other development projects as well. Because uh, when uh, multiple times government was starting to to develop, uh, you know, some islands in Karachi which are actually highly popul populated by the fishing communities. They have not taken care of the issues of, the, of those communities when they started construction of those projects. So at that time, communities uh, raised their concerns with the financial institutions and the people who were investing in money in those projects. Then they stop, uh, they, they stop the funding of uh, these kind of uh, projects. So I think you have highlighted a very pertinent issue that uh, inclusive engagement by the government and the private sector is a key to, to share the benefits of, uh, of any kind of projects. And also uh, this way we can, we can you know, the, cater the issue of opposition by the communities and other environmental groups. So it's, it's a very good uh, presentation. And though, we have not any experience, uh, experience that people are uh, uh, opposing to the renewable energy projects in Pakistan, because Pakistan is one of the 
seventh, you know, the vulnerable country to the climate change. That's why when we narrate the, uh, you know, the uh, the importance of the renewable energy in Pakistan, people are accepting uh, it. But this presentation applies on many other development projects in Pakistan. So thank you very much for this uh, research and uh, taking the community perspective into the in, in that research. So really very helpful and appreciated. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much indeed. That's very kind words. And uh, I think you are absolutely right about the timing of um, developer engagement with communities and that it needs to be early. Developers sometimes say that they don't want to engage too early in case um, things about the project change and then they have to tell people something different but actually what we suggest what research suggests is that establishing community contacts establishing a presence early in the community trying to build those relationships trying to build trust is more important because then if the details of the project do change you've already established that relationship that partnership with the community so I think you are absolutely right and that's that's really fascinating to hear what's happening in Pakistan in relation to that as well thank you very much indeed I was muted for a second. I see two very long questions from Azar Lashari. And I think the best thing to do would be maybe for you to just um, ask them to the group and then, um, yeah, and then Claire can, can go ahead and answer. Um, otherwise, Azar, are you in the room? Thank you very much, Claire, for your very wonderful presentation. Uh, my first question is uh, about uh, this uh, very turbulent uh, transition phase in which uh, we have to uh, move from the dirty fossil fuel based uh, uh, power to the clean and renewable energy. And that looks a very distant dream in the countries like Pakistan. And presently, we have been seeing uh, power uh, shortages and power outages very frequent and uh, the prices of fuels and uh, fossil fuels and energy is becoming quite expensive. And secondly, the international financial institutions like IMF and the World Bank has been pushing the government to remove the subsidies and uh, uh, increase the prices of energy and the fossil fuels. So uh, a lot of, uh, say, uh, marginalized and the poor sections of the society uh, for them, it is uh, the energy and the fossil fuels are becoming unaffordable. So, my first question is regarding uh, how to make uh, uh, how to make the energy uh, how to how to offer some uh, viable solutions for these marginalized and the poor sectors of society by the time we achieve transition to renewable energy. Secondly, you were talking about the opposition to the. Uh, climate change and the renewable energy. And uh, my impression is that uh, uh, you think that the, those who are, uh, who are uh, uneducated or who are unaware about the climate change, they are uh, big opposition to the renewable energy. But uh, don't you think that uh, these uh, lobbies, fossil fuel based lobbies who have strong material and financial interest associated with the uh, this uh, dirty energy, they are the big opposition to the uh, uh, climate change and renewable energy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Those are excellent questions. Um, and you described this as being a turbulent transition phase. And I, I couldn't agree more. I think that's a, an, a, an entirely apposite word. Um, I'll do the questions in reverse order, if I may. So, oh, you're absolutely right about the power of fossil fuel industries and the way in which they are able to dominate the narrative about the benefits and um, disbenefits that come from both fossil fuels and from renewable energy, um, the fundamental power that they have, the money that they have to be able to influence, um, provide influence through politics, through the funding that is given, and that filters down into communities. So, um, yes, they are such a big player 
sort of in the background sometimes, but through all of this, the role of the fossil fuel industry and the, the power that they have is absolutely key. Um, what very often happens at a local level is that people don't necessarily understand um, the necessity of taking action about climate change through supporting the renewable energy project that is in front of them or that is being proposed to them. And I'm not necessarily trying to say that that's because they're uneducated or if only people knew better, um, there is um, a, a, another myth that um, the public deficit model, that if only people knew better, they would support this wind farm or this solar farm and so on. And um, firstly, I think that there is, um, it's important to understand that people's views aren't necessarily based on them being uneducated or stupid, but they are based on their very real understanding, their lived experience of being in particular places, but also that the necessity of tackling climate change through um, renewable energy projects can be made more real, so it can be made more tangible, so we don't have to be talking about um, sea level rise in 100 years time or in 50 years time, we can be talking about the impacts that are happening now or will happen much more, um, much, much sooner or will happen much more locally, so making climate change as a concept real for people is, is part of the work that needs to be done, that's not because they're uneducated, but it's about trying to bring those big issues um, into everyday life. Um, you're quite right too about um, supporting marginalised communities, absolutely, and the role of big finance behind some of these projects. And again, the, the principle is that there will be locally relevant solutions that will help and support particular communities. Um, so I have colleagues here at Edinburgh who've been doing work on um, solar plants and solar devices that work really brilliantly in particular communities that are clean, that are a great way of cooking, for example, um, but that wouldn't work in other places. So locally relevant and locally applicable solutions absolutely can be found if we're trying to move forward and we're trying to bring everyone with us. Thank you. Right, and I think um, Andrea, if you want to ask your question next. Yeah, sorry, I'm in, in an open space. <laughs> um, so my question was, a, well, thank you very much for the presentation. It's really super interesting. But I wanted to know the results you present with your research is clear and results are clear. Uh, do they apply only to the European context or do you have examples of, for instance, in the global south, it may be cases where there are international companies having interest and, and do you have examples of good practices in that context? Thanks very much. That's an excellent question, Andrea. Thank you. Um, so most of the academic research on this topic has been done either in Europe or the US or Australia. So there is less research on um, these sorts of things happening um, in the global south, but there is some. And you're absolutely right about the role of um, international companies in particular locations. And actually that principle applies more broadly too. So some of the opposition that we see in Europe is to what's seen as being an outsider, um, a company that might be from a different country, that um, a big international conglomerate who wants to put something in this particular community. So that as a principle, we see quite widely. Um, I can Perhaps we could chat afterwards, or we can. I'm sorry, I'm doing international sign language for typing. Um, perhaps um, I could send you some some more of the research. I can signpost you to some more work, which is more specifically um, the global south. After after we've had this chat, I'd be very happy to do that if that would be helpful. That would be great. Thank you of course, very much. I'd be delighted. Um, I think uh, I'll pass the floor to Gaurav. Um, if you'd like to ask your question. Um, Hi, Sophie. This is not me. I don't know. Like, I think uh, it's. Oh, yeah. I see. You've got the. Sorry, Gaurav. Else, like, uh, it's not. Me, I think actually. it's. Yeah, sorry. I think it's me. It's because I think it was registered under our colleague Gaurav's name. So all of us are Gaurav. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> sorry about that, Gaurav. Um, yeah, so maybe just a. I guess just a point of one is a point of the really curiosity more on the regulations and the role it has played in in the cases uh, there. Uh, I know that it's very much Europe-centric experience, uh, 
in Asia, quite a lot of mechanisms are already in place when it comes to you know, environmental standards and community standards. Not successfully implemented, not usually followed, of course, still always a challenge. And I was just wondering, based on your experience, whether that mattered and how we were able to utilize that. I guess the other question is really more on framing. And I wonder whether in the way you've engaged, do you use just transition as a frame uh, in, when engaging with communities? I guess the concern I have, I was thinking is that, you know, when you go to communities and maybe this is from more of a, you know, Asian perspective and talking about framing it as opposition to renewables, it's, it can really be badly interpreted to say the least. It's you come across as, you know, uh, fighting for industry interest rather than actually looking at benefits sharing. And so I was wondering whether how you kind of framed it or was it actually useful uh, in that context? That's such an interesting question. Thank you very much. And um, you, you've hit on something really important because this idea of a just transition is is very new um, in the in the European context. This is um, just the last couple of years. And I would say before that, then actually what you've described as fighting for industry interests and not being about benefit sharing was much more usual as a way of understanding renewable energy developments or as a way of people responding to them it very often that that was the perception that it was industry that were trying to do things to local communities that were imposing them and there was not um, a sufficient opportunity for people to get any benefit or to give their to give their view so this is a sort of a new wave this idea about a just transition to net zero um, is a relatively new way of thinking about things and um, there has been some opposition to a just transition it's not something which has universal approval but it's very it's, it's very much the, the way that governments here are trying to take things forward accepting that we need to move towards low carbon futures accepting that there will be some opposition to that so trying to make sure that that benefits are spread, that there are opportunities for people, that those who are employed in the um, fossil fuel industries are helped to, to retrain and to give, give new job opportunities, that communities that are dependent on um, fossil fuels such as Aberdeen um, are given support to be able to transition to cleaner energy. So um, mentioning that as a, as a framing, that's, that's something that, you know, that, that I recognize for, for these contexts as well. Um, asking me about regulation too. So there is some countries in Europe um, and have quite a lot of regulation about um, trying to move towards renewable energy. And there are some interesting political differences. Um, so on one hand, there is um, a push at, an, at a European level to try and remove what's seen as barriers to renewable energy, to try and speed up planning processes. Um, around Europe, there are many gigawatts of renewable energy projects that are just waiting, um, that are either waiting to be approved or are waiting to be considered, um, and to try and speed things up through planning. So on one hand, there is a push to try and do that, and there is um, regulation and policy in place, for example, in Scotland about the way in which um, community acceptance can be helped, um, community partnerships can be sought through the benefits, so policies on giving benefits to communities. So on one hand, um, there is regulation in place and there's um, emphasis on trying to speed things up more. On the other hand, there are um, political reasons to try and um, uh, not necessarily push all renewable energy forward. So in the UK government, for example, um, fears that onshore wind farms are so unpopular that they don't support them, that they are, that will make them electorally unpopular. And that's, um, so there's a push for offshore wind, um, but not for onshore wind. So there is some variance in that, broadly speaking, um, moving forward, but um, with, with local differences, shall we say. Um, I'm going to try and not get too political about government matters um, in the UK and Scotland, so uh, perhaps best to move on to another question. Um, I think we'll move on to Mushtaq's question in a second, but um, 
I also had a very general question also in the scope of um, our, our main target audience of these webinars, which are civil society organizations. And this ties into my colleague Liam's question as well, which is basically, first of all, in a general sense, what is the role of NGOs and civil society in pushing forward public acceptance? And um, Liam's point being more about um, should, how do we move beyond or should we move beyond information campaigns towards sort of more communication, communication campaigns that can make a positive difference and how should these be framed? And in the context of that, what is the role of NGOs in, in doing this? Thanks very much, Sophie and Liam. Um, yeah, this is really, really fascinating. And there absolutely is a role for civil society, both in general and in particular places. So in general, being part of the conversation, moving things on so that we understand that there is a need for renewable energy, we understand that there is a need to tackle climate change, we understand that these things need to happen now, we can't push all these decisions into the future. Being part of that background, part of that context, establishing that these sorts of principles matter. I think there's also a more specific role in particular communities where projects are planned that's perhaps part of that liaison between government or developers and those communities having that trusted intermediary role where the there is um, a way of communicating and spreading information but not just information um, distribution you're absolutely right this has to be about consultation it has to be about listening as well so i think that there's a role broadly and also as being those trusted intermediaries in the communities doing that discussion and negotiation thank you um all right i think uh then i'll let mushtak ask ask his question Uh, th thanks uh, for your uh, uh, fascinating presentation. My, my question is uh, related with uh, power imbalances uh, uh, in the between uh, fossil fuel and RE industry. So given that power imbalances, uh, there is a risk of uh, using uh, basically the issues of uh, uh, raising the issues of uh, just and fair transition by the fossil fuel industry. There could be some instances. Uh, so how to mitigate that risk uh, uh, given the power imbalances? There is a vast power imbalance between fossil fuel and RE industry. So communication is fine, uh, in intermediation is fine, but beyond that, when there is a, uh, the communities want to have a full-fledged campaign for benefit sharing. And uh, so if that campaign is organized, it could be potentially used by fossil fuel industry. So how to mitigate that uh, uh, risk actually. Uh, it is a question about strategy uh, as well as perspective. Thanks. Thanks very much indeed. Oh, you're absolutely right about the the lack of power that communities tend to have, um, not just against the fossil fuel industries, but um, it can be very difficult for communities to um, have a voice, to be heard, to be listened, to be taken seriously. And of course, communities aren't homogenous. Communities can be divided. Um, there are different interests. Um, there'll be some voices within a community that is stronger. So all of this is not straightforward at all. Um, the in terms of the power imbalance between fossil fuel and the renewable energy industries or re renewable energy, um, I think this is part of that broader background context about the importance of what renewable energy can bring, the importance of tackling climate change, about taking action now, the, the benefits that renewable energy can bring, and trying to make sure that those benefits aren't just these great national, international benefits, but that also that communities are able to see that benefits can come, can and should come to them locally as well, and that the renewable energy in, renewable energy industries can provide more than the fossil fuel industries. And I think so it's both partly a bigger picture question, the context in which we are and, um, and, and more specifically on the ground. And it's interesting that um, in Europe, certainly things have changed, that, that background picture, that big conversation has changed very starkly recently. So the um, 
um, energy prices have gone up um, dramatically across Europe. Um, the invasion of Ukraine has really put the spotlight on a lot of things, but has put the spotlight on um, fossil fuels, upon importing energy, upon not being self-sufficient, about not generating our own energy. And it has changed the background. It has changed that bigger picture in which we are now thinking about taking projects forward. So there are things to do at the bigger level, the bigger picture, but also more specifically in particular locations. Um, this was also a comment by Damaria um, about um, in Indonesia, that there is um, a push for using solar panels, but the government doesn't campaign or encourage um, the transformation to use these and that this is really a challenge. And maybe I guess this is a question of sort of the role that government plays and how to um, change the way that government acts. Um, if you could maybe speak on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I've been talking about communities and what communities can and should do, but this needs it needs government intervention from a, from a higher level too. This is not something that communities are able to push for alone. Um, there needs to be um, government support for renewable energy for particular renewable energies. Um, there needs to be um, regulation in place. There needs to be planning and um, guidance in place. There needs to be those environmental standards we were talking about. So there has to be a role for government in creating a landscape in which projects can go ahead. So um, government support is absolutely vital. And um, this is a terrain in which there are, of course, a number of key players, all of whom are needed. Um, there's um, an academic, UK academic called Elizabeth Shove, and she talks about a pinwheel. And what she means is that there's something in the middle that you want to happen, you want to change, you want to change to renewable energy, then there are parts of the cog all around that all need to be moving in sync together so we need if we want renewable energy then we need government support we need to be able to have um and NGOs working as part of the picture. We need civil society moving forward. We need public understanding of the need to um, address climate change. We need support for communities to be able to empower themselves, to express their views, and to generate um, situation to generate um, uh, outcomes that are that are um, meaningful and appropriate um, locally. So all of those things need to be in place and all moving in the same direction to be able to to move forward. I'm sorry, I'm waving my jazz hands through you um, at you all through the ether. That was that was international sign language for a pinwheel. I'm, I'm not sure that was terribly helpful, but um, sorry about that. That's all right. <laughs> um, we have another question about um, what uh, perspectives are actually covered in terms of when we talk about community. I don't know if um, Fiza Qureshi Pak, if you want to um, expand on that or if. Thank you, uh, Sophie, and thank you very much, Claire, for really a wonderful presentation. We have learned a lot, and uh, uh, I mean, my question is around the community perspective, but specifically the community women perspective. I mean, is your studies really covering that perspective? Because as far as South Asian countries, and specifically the country like ours, Pakistan is concerned, so whenever we are working with the communities, so really the women perspective and the impact the women are putting on such type of projects is really meaningful. So I mean, I, I really want to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. You're absolutely right. Um, so yes, community groups are, are, are not homogenous. There are differences between them and the role of women is absolutely key. There's been really interesting research that um, from a European perspective, which suggests that women support renewable energy more strongly, that women are much more in favour of moving towards clean energy futures and the actions that are needed to get there. And therefore, it's vital that there are processes which allow their voices to be heard. Um, so women are, generally speaking, more in favour of renewable energy, but generally speaking, participate less in decision making. Um, so the, um, the, the proportion of women who are involved in renewable energy um, developments or renewable energy projects um, is much fewer than, than men. Um, and the, the women in communities who um, participate tend to be 
very many fewer. So it tends to be um, local community council leaders who are men, or it tends to be um, um, spokespeople for particular community organisations who are men. So the conversation tends to be dominated by male voices rather than women's voices. Um, there is um, so this is one of the reasons why it's it's really vital that if we're talking about engagement, we do it through processes that are accessible for all, for all groups. And um, what's been interesting is we are now all much more used to doing this, to all, you know, waving at each other through the ether, that we, um, we communicate through screens now much more than we used to a couple of years ago. And um, some new research from colleagues in my department has suggested that, there's lots to say, but that that actually has been quite good for getting women to participate because you you don't have to leave the house you can be um you can have children behind you and you can participate still you can be cooking the dinner and you can join a meeting so actually the the, the fact that we all communicate virtually has in some ways allowed more women to participate which has been a very good thing but there is um research on the role of women in renewable energy and the women in, in climate action and again um doing that international sign language for typing i'd be delighted to to put to to send you some of that afterwards if that would be at all helpful because you're absolutely right about the role of women in moving towards clean energy futures all right um if there's any more questions um just raise your hand or feel free to just speak. We have five more minutes left, so maybe we have Thank time. Thank you so much. Can I take one minute, please? Yes. Uh, thank you, Claire, for your very nice presentation. Very important for uh, Bangladesh, actually, because when we actually do not want to engage people with any, any process. However, we... Um, Methodically, for any large-scale infrastructure or mega project, it requires an environmental impact assessment. And during the environmental impact assessment, there is a public consultation procedure which is to be done, which is not followed in a proper way. And they will not find EIA publicly available for many big projects that are going on, but mostly for fossil fuel industry. But my question is the study uh, presented is very, very rigorous and I appreciate it, but it's quite different than the demographic, cultural and political landscape here in Bangladesh. Therefore, of course, we demand it um, always to include community voice and community perspectives from the inception level to the implementation level. Uh, which will be there always, but I'm, uh, I was more keen to know uh, for the renewable uh, energy projects, uh, in which way we could, we could ensure community part of the benefits. Uh, maybe uh, climate change and vulnerability to the climate change itself is a benefit for the people of Bangladesh. But it's not very, you know, like the awareness level among the population is not like the Western community. So uh, we also need to work on that. But at the same time, uh, in which way the benefits can be shared among the community for uh, renewable energy projects, if you can say a few words on that. Mm -hmm. Yes, of course. Thank you very much indeed. Um, the you're absolutely right, of course, that these are very different contexts, um, but that there are still things which apply broadly. And so the delivery of locally appropriate benefits has been something which research from a wide variety of different contexts has found to be important. So what those benefits might be will vary greatly but that there will be things that are meaningful locally so what would be suitable in communities in Bangladesh wouldn't be suitable in communities in Scotland and, and vice versa and one finds out about what those are by knowing those local communities and identifying local need 
Um, so there's a new, very large wind farm planned just outside Edinburgh, and I'm working with the developer to try and provide benefits to local communities, and we're identifying communities that are suffering from deprivation, that um, have um, a lack of resources, lack of opportunities, and trying to tailor benefits that are specific to those particular communities. Most of Edinburgh is very nice and um, not does not suffer from deprivation, but there are particular pockets where um, resource is definitely needed. So that is the, the principle, without knowing about your particular context, that's the principle which emerges from research about um, an understanding of a particular community and being able to identify what the particular local needs are there. All right. Um, thank you. I think that was the last question. We've um, basically reached the end of the webinar. Thank you so much, Claire, for presenting and um, everyone for joining. This has been a really interesting um, discussion. Um, just for your information, we will be sending around the recording, the presentation slides, um, Claire's references, and any other um, requests. Um, and we will also be sending you a short survey because, like I said, we hope to sort of get a better idea of um, the questions that maybe weren't answered or the questions that you'd like to learn more about in a sort of um, deeper sense. And um, yeah, I hope everyone enjoyed it and um, have a great rest of your day. Thank you all very much for coming and for the really excellent, really helpful and informative questions. It's been a, a pleasure to speak with you all and to connect with you all this morning. Thank you very much. Thank you.